Notice. This book is produced in Daisy Digital Talking Book, Daisy Text Only and in print format for people with bona fide print disability by V4U. This book is created for special distribution for the print disabled in accordance with Section 52 Clause 1 Sub Clause ZB of the Copyright Act of India as amended in 2012. The Daisy Digital Talking Book Daisy text only, braille book is permitted to be used only by persons with print disabilities. Any further reproduction distribution to any person without a print disability or any commercial use of this book is strictly prohibited and will be subject to a legal action. Hornbill, textbook in English for class 11, core course. Contents. It has two parts, the reading skills and the writing skills. The reading skills includes Chapter number 1, The Portrait of a Lady by Kushwan Singh and a poem called A Photograph by Shirley Tolson. Chapter number 2, We Are Not Afraid to Die If We Can All Be Together by Gordon Cook and Alan East. Chapter number 3. Discovering Tut. The Saga Continues by A. R. Willems and a poem called The Laburnum Top by Ted Humes. Chapter number 4. Landscape of the Soul by Nathalie Troveroy and a poem called The Voice of the Rain by Walt Whitman. Chapter number 5. The Ailing Planet, The Green Movement's Role by Nani Palkiwala. Chapter number 6. The Browning Version by Terence Rattigan. And a poem called Childhood by Marcus Natten. Chapter number 7. The Adventure by Jayanth Narlikar. Chapter number 8. Silk Road by Nick Middleton and a poem called Father to Son by Elizabeth Jennings. And the writing skills include number one, the note making, number two, summarizing, number three, subtitling, number four, essay writing, number five, letter writing and number six, creative writing. Hornbill, textbook in English for class 11, core course. Chapter number 1 The Portrait of a Lady, written by Kushwan Singh. Page number 3. Notice these expressions in the text, infer their meaning from the context. Point 1 The thought was almost revolting. Point 2 an expanse of pure white serenity. Point 3. A turning point. Point 4. Accepted her seclusion with resignation. Point 5. A veritable bedlam of cherubims. Point 6. Frivolous rebuke. Point 7. The sagging skins of the dilapidated drum. So the story begins. My grandmother, like everybody's grandmother, was an old woman. She had been old and wrinkled for the 20 years that I had known her. People said that she had once been young and pretty and had even had a husband. But that was hard to believe. My grandfather's portrait hung above the mantelpiece in the drawing room. He wore a big turban and loose-fitting clothes. His long, white beard covered the best part of his chest and he looked at least a hundred years old. He did not look the sort of person who would have a wife or children. He looked as if he could only have Lots and lots of grandchildren. 
As for my grandmother being young and pretty, the thought was almost revolting. She often told us of the games she used to play as a child. That seemed quite absurd and undignified on her part, and we treated it like the fables of the prophets she used to tell us. She had always been short and fat and slightly bent. Her face was a crisscross of wrinkles running from everywhere to everywhere. No, we were certain she had always been as we had known her. Chapter number one, The Portrait of the Lady by Kushwan Singh. Page number four. Old, so terribly old that she could not have grown older and had stayed at the same age for 20 years. She could never have been pretty, but she was always beautiful. She hobbled about the house in spotless white with one hand resting on her waist to balance her stoop and the other telling the beads of her rosary. Her silver locks were scattered untidily over her pale, puckered face and her lips constantly moved in inaudible prayer. Yes, she was beautiful. She was like the winter landscape in the mountains, an expanse of pure white serenity, breathing peace and contentment. My grandmother and I were good friends. My parents left me with her when they went to live in the city and were constantly together. She used to wake me up in the morning and get me ready for the school. She said her morning prayer in a monotonous sing-song while she bathed and dressed me in the hope that I would listen and get to know it by heart. I listened because I loved her voice but never bothered to learn it. Then. She would fetch my wooden slate, which she had already washed and plastered with yellow chalk, a tiny earthen ink pot and a red pen, tie them all in a bundle and hand it to me. After a breakfast of a thick, stale chapati with a little butter and sugar spread on it, we went to school. She carried several stale chapatis with her for the village dogs. My grandmother always went to the school with me because the school would, was attached to the temple. The priest taught us the alphabet and the morning prayer. While the children sat in the rows on either side of the veranda singing the alphabet, or the prayer in a chorus, my grandmother sat inside reading the scriptures. When we had both finished, we would walk back together. This time, the village dogs would meet us at the temple door. They followed us to our home, growling and fighting with each other for the chapatis we threw at them. When my parents were comfortably settled in the city, they sent for us. That was a turning point in our friendship. Although we shared the same room, my grandmother no longer came to school with me. I used to go to an English school in a motor bus. There were no do dogs in the streets and she took to feeding sparrows in the courtyard of our city house. As the years rolled by, we saw less of each other. For the same time, she continued to wake me up and get me ready for the school. When I came back 
she would ask me what the teacher had taught me. Chapter number one, the portrait of a lady, by Kushban Singh. Page number five. I would tell her English words and little things of Western science and learning, the law of gravity, Archimedes' principle, and the world being round, etc. This made her unhappy. She could not help me with my lessons. She did not believe in the things they taught at the English school and was disturbed that there was no teaching about God and scriptures. One day, I announced that we were being given music lessons. She was very disturbed. To her, music had lured associations. It was the monopoly of harlots and beggars and not meant for general folk. She said nothing, but her silence meant disapproval. She rarely talked to me after that. When I went up to university, I was given a room of my own. The common link of friendship was snapped. My grandmother accepted her seclusion with resignation. She rarely left her spinning wheel to talk to anyone. From sunrise to sunset, she sat by her wheel, spinning and reciting prayers. Only in the afternoon, she relaxed for a while to feed the sparrows, while she sat in the veranda, breaking the bread into little bits Hundreds of little birds collect around her, creating a veritable bedlam of chirrupings. Some came and perched on her legs, others on her shoulders. Some even sat on her head. She smiled but never shooed them away. It was to be the happiest half hour of a day. When I decided to go abroad for further studies, I was sure my grandmother would be upset. I would be away for five years and at her age, one could never tame. But my grandmother could. She was not even sentimental. She came to leave me at the railway station but did not talk or show any emotion. Her lips moved in prayer. Her mind was lost in prayer. Her fingers were busy telling the beads of her rosary. Silently, she kissed my forehead and when I left, I cherished the moist imprint as perhaps the last sign of physical contact between us. But that was not so. After five years, I came back home and was met by her at the station. She did not look a day older. She still had no time for words. And while she clasped me in her arms, I could hear her reciting her prayers. Even on the first day of my arrival, her happiest movements were with the sparrows, whom she fed longer and with frivolous rebukes. In the evening, a change came over her. She did not pray. She collected the woman of the neighborhood, got an old drum and started singing. For several hours, she thumbed the sagging skin of the dilapidated drum and sang for the homecoming of warriors. Chapter number one, The Portrait of a Lady by Kushwan Singh. Page number six. We had to persuade her to stop to avoid overstraining. That was the first time since I had known her that she did not pray. 
the next morning she was taken ill it was a mild fever and the doctor told us that it would go but my grandmother thought differently she told us that her end was near she said that since only a few hours before the close of the last chapter of her life she had omitted to pray she was not going to waste any more time talking to us we protested but she ignored our protests she lay peacefully in the bed praying and telling her beads even before we could suspect her lips stopped moving and the rosary fell from her lifeless fingers a peaceful pallor spread on her face and we knew that she was dead we lifted her off the bed and as in customary laid her on the ground and covered her with a red shroud after a few hours of mourning we left her alone to make arrangements for her funeral in the evening we went to her room with a crude stretcher to take her to be cremated the sun was setting and had lit her room and veranda with a blaze of golden light we stopped halfway in the courtyard all over the veranda and in her room right up to where she lay dead and stiff wrapped in the red shroud thousands of sparrows sat scattered on the floor there was no chirping we felt sorry for the birds and my mother fetched some bread for them she broke it into little crumbs the way my grandmother used to and threw it to them the sparrows took no notice of the bread when we carried my grandmother's corpse off they flew away quietly next morning the sweeper swept the bread crumbs into the dustbin with this the chapter comes to an end understanding the text mention point 1 the three phases of the author's relationship with his grandmother before he left the country to study abroad point 2 three reasons why the author's grandmother was disturbed when he started going to the city school page number 7 point number 3 three ways in which the author's grandmother spent her days after he grew up point 4 the odd way in which the author's grandmother behaved just before she died point 5 the way in which the sparrows expressed their sorrow when the author's grandmother died talking about the text talk to your partner about the following point 1 the author's grandmother was a religious person what are the direct different ways in which we come to know this point number 2 describe the changing relationship between the author and his grandmother did their feelings for each other change point number 3 would you agree that the author's grandmother was a person strong in character if yes give instances that show this point number 4 have you known someone like the author's grandmother do you feel the same sense of loss with regard to someone whom you have loved and lost thinking about language point 1 which language do you think the author 
and his grandmother used while talking to each other. Point 2. Which language do you use to talk to elderly relatives in your family? Point 3. How would you say a diapidated drum in your language? Point 4. Can you think of a song or a poem in your language that talks of, of homecoming? Working with words 1. Notice the following uses of the word tell in the text. Point 1. Her fingers were busy telling the beads of her rosary. Point 2. I would tell her English words and little things of Western science and learning. Point 3. At her age, one could never tell. Point number 4. She told us that her end was near. Page number 8. Given below are four different senses of the word tell. Match the meanings to the users listed above. Point 1. Make something known to someone in spoken or written words. Point 2. Count while reciting. Point 3. Be sure. Point 4. Give information to somebody. 2. Notice the different senses of the word take. Point 1. To take to something means to begin to do something as a habit. Point 2. To take ill means to suddenly become ill. Locate these phrases in the text and notice the way they are used. Task 3. The word hobble means to walk with difficulty because the legs and the feet are in bad condition. Tick the words in the box below that also refers to a manner of walking. The words are haggle, wriggle, shuffle, paddle, stride, swagger, ride, trudge, waddle, slog. Noticing form. Notice the form of the verbs italicized in these sentences. Point 1. My grandmother was an old woman. She had been old and wrinkled for the 20 years that I had known her. People said that she had been young and pretty and had even had a husband but that was hard to believe. When we both point two when we both had finished we would walk back together. Point three when I came back she would ask me what the teacher had taught me. It was the first time since I had known her, that she did not pray. Point 5. The sun was setting and had lit her room and veranda with a golden light. These are examples of the past perfect forms of verb, which we recount things in the distant past. We use this form. Page number 9. Things to do. Talk with your family members about elderly people who you have been intimately connected with and who are not there with you now. Write a short description of someone you liked a lot. Chapter 1 has a poem along with the story and the name of the poem is 
A photograph written by Shirley Tolson page number 11 stanza 1 The cardboard shows me how it was when the two girl cousins went paddling each one holding one of my mother's hands and she the big girl some 12 years or so all three stood still to smile through their hair at the uncle with the camera. A sweet face, my mother's, that was before I was born. And the sea, which appears to have changed less, washed their terribly transient feet. Stanza 2 Some twenty, thirty years later, she would laugh at the snapshot. See Betty and Dolly, she would say, and look how they dressed us for the beach. The sea holiday was her past. Mine is her laughter. Both wry with the laboured ease of loss. Stanza 3 Now she has been dead nearly as many years as that girl lived. And of this circumstance, there is nothing to say at all. It silence silences. So with this, the poem comes to an end. Now, it's time for the question and answers. Infer the meaning of the following words from the context. 1. Paddling. 2. Transient. Now look up the dictionary to see if your inference is right. Page number 12. Think it out. Question 1. What does the word cardboard denote in the poem? Why has this word been used? Question 2. What has the camera captured? Question 3. What has not changed over the years? Does this suggest something to you? Question 4. The poet's mother laughed at the snapshot. What did this laugh indicate? Question 5. What is the meaning of the line, both why with the laboured ease of loss? Question 6. What does the circumstance refer to? Question 7. The three stanzas depict three different phases. What are they? Hornbill, textbook in English for class 11, core course. Chapter number 2. We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. Written by Gordon Cook and Alan East. Page number 13. Notice these expressions in the text and for their meaning from the context. Point 1. Honing our seafaring skills. Point 2. Ominous silence. Point 3. Mayday calls. Point 4. Pin pricks in the vast ocean. Point 5. A tousled head. So the chapter starts. In July 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan, six years old, daughter Suzanne, seven years old, and I set sail from Plymouth, England to duplicate the round the world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. For the longest time, Mary and I, a 37-year-old businessman, had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer and for the past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time honing our seafaring skills in British waters. Our boat 
wave walker a 23 meter 30 ton wooden hulled beauty had been professionally built and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find the first leg of our planned three year one lakh five thousand kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of africa to cape town there before heading east we took on two crewmen american larry vigil and swiss herb segler to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas the southern indian ocean chapter 2 we are not afraid to die if we all can be together page number 14 on our second day out of cape town we began to encounter strong gales for the next few weeks they blew continuously gales did not worry me but the size of the waves was alarming up to 15 meters as high as our mainmast december 25 found us 3500 kilometers east of cape town despite atrocious weather we had a wonderful holiday complete with a christmas tree new year's day saw no improvement in the weather but we reasoned that it had to change soon and it did change for the worse at dawn on january 2 the waves were gigantic we were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots. As the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us and the screaming of the wind and the spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope in the loop across the stern. Then we double lashed everything, went through our life raft drill, attached lifelines, donned oil skins and life jackets, and waited. The first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m. with an ominous silence. The wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark. Then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towards aft of the ship. With horror, I realized that it was not a cloud but a wave like no other I had ever seen. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest. The roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment I thought we might ride over it. But then, a tremendous explosion shook the deck. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship. My head smashed into the wheel, and I was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves. I accepted my approaching death, and I was losing consciousness. I felt quite peaceful. Unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water a few meters away. Wave Walker was near capsizing. Her masts, 
almost horizontal. Then a wave hurled her upright. My lifeline jerked, taut. I grabbed the guardrails and sailed through the air into the wave walker's main boom. Subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll. My reeds cracked. My left ribs cracked. My mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. Water, water everywhere. I could feel that the sheep had water below and I dare not abandon the will to investigate. Chapter number two. We are not afraid to die if we all can be together. Page number 15. Suddenly, the front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared. We are sinking, she screamed. The decks are smashed. We are full of water. Take the wheel, I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch. Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen. Broken timbers hung at crazy angles. The whole starboard side bulged in boards. Clods, crockery, charts, tins and toils sloshed about in deep water. I half swam, half crawled into the children's cabin. Are you all right? I asked. Yes, they answered from the upper bunk. But my head hurts a bit, said Sue, pointing to a big bump above her eyes. I had no time to worry about bumped heads. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, I struggled back on deck. With the starboard side bashed open, we were taking water with each wave that broke over us. If I couldn't make some repairs, we would surely sink. Somehow, I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gapping holes. Some water continued to stream below, but most of it was now being deflected over the side. More problems arose when our hand pumps started to block up with the debris floating around the cabins and the electric pump short-circuited. The water label rose threateningly. Back on deck, I found that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard. Along with the four-stay stair, sail, the jeep, the dinghies, and the main anchor. Then I remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor. I connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked. The night dragged on with an endless, bitterly cold routine of pumping, steering, and working the radio. We were getting no replies to our mayday calls, which was not surprising in this remote corner of the world. Sue's head had swollen alarmingly. She had two enormous black eyes, and now she showed us a deep cut on her arm. When I asked her why she didn't made more of her injuries before this, she replied, I didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save us all. By morning on January 3, the pumps had the water label sufficiently under control for us to take 
two hours rest in rotation. But we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the waterline. And on checking, I found that nearly all the boat's main reef frames were smashed down to the keel. Chapter number two. We are not afraid to die if we can all be together. Page number 16. In fact, there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few cardboard partitions. We had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit, but wave walker wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach Australia. I checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. One of them is Isle Amsterdam was a French scientific base. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. But unless the wind and sea abated so we could hoist sail, our chances would be slim indeed. The great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action. On January 4, after 36 hours of continuous pumping, we reached the last few centimeters of water. Now, we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in. We could not set any sail on the main cast. Pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damaged section of the hull apart. So, we hoisted the storm jib and headed for where I thought the two islands were. Mary found some corn biff and cracker biscuits and we ate our fast meal in almost two days. But our respite was short-lived. At 4 p.m., black clouds began building up behind us. Within the hour, the wind was back to 40 knots and the seas were getting higher. The weather continued to deteriorate throughout the night and by dawn on January 5, our situation was again desperate. When I went in to comfort the children, John asked, Daddy, are we going to die? I tried to assure him that we could make it. But Daddy, he went on, we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together. You and Mommy, Sue and I. I could find no words with which to respond, but I left the children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything I had. To protect the weakened starboard side, I decided to heap to with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22-litre plastic barrels of paraffin. That evening, Mary and I sat together holding hands as the motion of this ship brought more and more water in through the broken planks. We both felt the end was very near, but Wave Walker rode out of the storm and by the morning of January 6, with the wind easing, I tried to get a reading on the sextant. Back in the chart room, I worked on wind speeds, changes of course, drift and current in an effort to calculate our position. Chapter number two. We are not afraid to die if we all can be together. 
page number 17. The best I could determine was that we were somewhere in 1,50,000 kilometers of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island. While I was thinking, Sue, moving painfully, joined me. The left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits. She gave me a card she had made. On the front, she had drawn caricatures of Mary and me with the words, Here are some funny people. Did they make you laugh? I laughed a lot as well. Inside was a message. Oh, how I love you both. So, this card is to say thank you. And let's hope for the best. Somehow, we had to make it. I checked and rechecked my calculations. We had lost our main compass and I was using a spa spare which had not been corrected for magnetic variations. I made an allowance for this and another estimate of the influence of the westerly currents which flow through this part of the Indian Ocean. About 2 p.m. I went on desk and asked Larry to stir a course of 185 degrees. If we were lucky, I told him with a conviction and did not fear. He could expect to see the island at about 5 p.m. Then, with a heavy heart, I went below, climbed on my bunk and amazingly dozed off. When I woke up, it was 6 p.m. and growing dark. I knew we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left, we couldn't hope to beat back onto the westerly winds. At that moment, a tousled head appeared by my bunk. Can I have a hug? Jonathan asked. Sue was right behind him. Why I am getting a hug now? I asked. Because you are the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain, my son replied. No, not today, John. I'm afraid. Why you must be? said Sue in a matter-of-fact voice. You found the island. What? I shouted. It's out there, in front of us, they chorused. As big as a battleship. I rushed on deck and gazed with relief at the stark outline of Eiley Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece a volcanic rock with little vegetation, the most beautiful island in the world. We anchored offshore for the night, and the next morning, all 28 inhabitants of the island cheered as they helped us ashore. With land under my feet again, my thoughts were full of Larry and Herbie, cheerful and optimistic under the distressed stress, and of Mary, who stayed at the will for all those crucial hours. Most of all, I thought of a seven-year-old girl who did not want us to worry about a head injury, which subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot between skin and skull and a six-year-old boy who was not afraid to die. So with this, the story comes to an end. And now some question and answers. Understanding the text. Question 1. List the steps taken by the captain. 1. 
to protect the ship when rough weather began. 2. To check the flooding of the water in the ship. Question 2. Describe the mental condition of the voyagers on 4th and 5th January. Question 3. Describe the shifts in the narration of the events as indicated in the three sections of the text. Give a subtitle to each section. Talking about the text. <coughs> Discuss the following questions with your partner. Question 1. What difference did you notice between the reaction of the adults and the children when they faced the danger? Question 2. How does the story suggest that optimism helps to endure the direst stress? Question 3. What lessons do we learn from such hazardous experiences when we are face to face with death? Question 4. Why do you think people undertake such adventurous expeditions in spite of the risks involved? Thinking about language. Question 1. We have come across words like gale and storm in the account. Here are two more words for storm. Typhoon, cyclone. How many words does your language have for storm? Question 2. Here are the terms for different kind of vessels. Yacht, boat, canoe, ship, steamer and schooner. Think of similar terms in your language. Catamaran is a kind of boat. Do you know which Indian language this word is derived from? Check the dictionary. Question 4. Have you heard any boatman's songs? What kind of emotions do these songs usually express. Working with words. The following words used in the text as ship terminology are also commonly used in another sense. In what context would you use the other meanings? The words are not, stern, boom, hatch, Anchor. Question 2. The following three compound words end in ship. What does each of them mean? 1. Airship. 2. Flagship. 3. Lightship. Question number 3. The following are the meanings listed in the dictionary against the phrase Take on. In which meaning is it used in the third para of the account? Take on something means to begin to have a particular quality or appearance. To assume something. Take Somebody on means to employ somebody or to engage somebody. To accept somebody as one's opponent in a game, contest or conflict. Take somebody or something on means to decide to do something or to allow something or somebody to enter, example a bus a plane or a ship to take something or somebody on board. Hornbill Chapter number 3 Discovering Tut The Saga Continues Written by A. R. Willems Notice these expressions in the text. 
infer their meaning from the context. 1. Forensic reconstruction 2. Scudded across 3. Casket grey 4. Resurrection 5. Funerary treasures 6. Circumvented 7. Computed tomography 8. Airy detail So the story starts He was just a teenager when he died the last heir of a powerful family that had ruled Egypt and its empire for centuries. He was laid to rest, laden with gold, and eventually forgotten. Since the discovery of his tomb in 1922, the modern world has speculated about what happened to him with murder being the most extreme possibility. Now, leaving his tomb for the first time in almost 80 years, Tut has undergone a city scan that offers new clues about his life and death and provides precise data for an accurate forensic reconstruction of the boyish pharaoh. An angry wind stirred up ghostly dust devils as King Tut was taken from his resting place in the ancient Egyptian cemetery known as the Valley of the Kings. Dark bellied clouds had scudded across the desert sky all day and now were veiling the stars in casket grey. It was 6 p.m. on January 5, 2005. The world's most famous mummy glided head first into a city scanner brought here to probe the lingering medical mysteries of this little understood young ruler who died more than 3,000 300 years ago. All afternoon, the usual line of tourists from around the world had descended into the cramped, rock-cut tomb, some 26 feet underground, to pay their respects. They gazed at the murals on the walls of the burial chamber and peered at Tut's glided face. The most striking feature of his mummy shaped outer coffin lid. Some visitors read from guidebooks in a whisper. Others stood silently, perhaps pondering Tut's untimely death in his late teens, or wondering with a shiver if the pharaoh's curse death or misfortune falling upon those who disturbed him was really true. The mummy is in very bad condition because of what Carter did in the 1920s, said Zahi Hawass, Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, as he leaned over the body for a long first look. Carter, Howard Carter, that is, was the British archaeologist who in 1922 discovered Tot's tomb after years of futile searching. Its contents, though hastily ransacked in antiquity, were surprisingly complete. They remain the richest royal collection ever found and have become part of the pharaoh's legend. Stunning artifacts in gold, their eternal brilliance meant to guarantee resurrection, caused a sensation at the time of the discovery and still get the most attention. 
But Tut was also buried with everyday things he would want in the afterlife. Board games, a bronze razor, lilin undergarments, cases of food and wine. After months of carefully recording the pharaoh's funerary treasures, Carter began investigating his three nested coffins. Opening the first, he found a shroud adorned with garlands of willow and olive leaves, wild celery, lotus petals and cornflowers that faded evidence of a burial in March or April. When he finally reached the mummy, though he ran into trouble, the ritual resins had hardened, cementing Tut to the bottom of a solid gold coffin. No amount of legitimate force could move them. Carter wrote later, What was to be done? The sun can beat down like a hammer this far south in Egypt, and Carter tried to use it to loosen the resins. For several hours, he set the mummy outside in blazing sunshine that heated it to 149 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing budged. He reported with scientific detachment that the consolidated material had to be chiseled away from beneath the limbs and trunk before it was possible to raise the king's remains. In his defense, Carter really had little choice. If he hadn't cut the mummy free, thieves most certainly would have circumvented the guards and ripped it apart to remove the gold. In Tut's time, the royals were fabulously wealthy and they thought or hoped they could take their riches with them. For his journey, journey to the great beyond, King Tut was lavished with glittering goods, precious collars, inlaid necklaces and bracelets, rings, amulets, a ceremonial apron, sandals, sheets of his for his fingers and toes, and the now iconic inner coffin and mask, all of pure gold. To separate Tut from his adornments, Carter's men removed the mummy's head and severed nearly every major joint. Once they had finished, they reassembled the remains on a layer of sand in a wooden box with padding that concealed the damage, the bed where Tut now rests. Archaeology has changed substantially in the intervening decades, focusing less on treasure and more on the fascinating details of life and intriguing mysteries of death. It also uses more sophisticated tools, including medical technology. In 1968, more than 40 years after Carter's discovery, an anatomy professor x-rayed the mummy and revealed a startling fact. Beneath the raisin that kicks his chest, his breastbone and front ribs are missing. Today, diagnostic imaging can be done with computed tomography or CT, by which hundreds of X-rays in cross-section are put together like slices of bread to create a three-dimensional virtual body. What more would a city scan reveal of Tut 
than the X-ray? And could it answer two of the biggest questions still lingering around him? How did he die? And how old was he at the time of his death? King Tut's demise was a big event, even by royal standards. He was the last of his family's line, and his funeral was the death rattle of a dynasty. But the particulars of his passing away and its aftermaths are unclear. Amenhotep III, Tut's father or grandfather, was a powerful pharaoh who ruled for almost four decades at the height of the 18th dynasty's golden age. His son, Amenhotep IV, succeeded him and initiated one of the strangest periods in the history of Anishian Egypt. The new pharaoh promoted the worship of the Aten. The sun disk changed his name to Aken Naten or servant of the Aten and moved the religious capital from the old city of Thebes to the new city of Aken Taten, known now known as Amarna. He further shocked the country by attacking Amun, a major god, smashing his images and closing his temples. It must have been a horrific time, said Ray Johnson, director of the University of Chicago's Research Center in Luxor. The site of Anishian Thebes, the family that had ruled for centuries, was coming to an end. And then Akhenaten went a little wacky. After Akhenaten's death, a mysterious ruler named Smenkare appeared briefly and exited with hardly a trace. And then a very young Tutankhaten took the throne, King Tut, as he is widely known today. The boy king soon changed his name to Tutankhamun, leaving image of Amun, and oversaw it restoration of the old days. He reigned for about nine years and then died unexpectedly. Regardless of his pain and speculations about his fate, Tut is one mummy among many in Egypt. How many? No one knows. The Egyptian mummy project which began an inventory in late 2003, has recorded almost 600 so far and is still counting. The next phase, scanning the mummies with a portable city machine, donated by the National Geographic Society and Simons, its manufacturer. King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned in death as in life moving regularly ahead of his countrymen. A city machine scanned the mummy head to toe creating 1700 digital x-ray images in cross-section. Tut's head scanned in 0.62 mm slices to register its intricate structure takes on eerie detail in the resulting image, with Tut's entire body similarly recorded. A team of specialists 
in radiology, forensics and anatomy began to probe the secrets that the winged goddesses of a glided burial shrine protected for so long. The night of the scan, workmen carried Tut from the tomb in his box. Like fall bearers, they climbed a ramp and a flight of stairs into the swirling sand outside, then rose on a hydraulic lift into the trailer that held the scanner. Twenty minutes later, two men emerged, sprinted for an office nearby, and returned with a pair of white plastic fans. The million dollar scanner had quit because of sand in a cooler fan. Curse of the Pharaoh choked a card nervously. Eventually, the substitute fans worked well enough to finish the procedure. After checking that no data had been lost, the technicians turned Tut over to the workmen, who carried him back to his tomb. Less than three hours after he was removed from his coffin, the pharaoh again rested in peace where the funerary priests had led him so long ago. Back in the trailer, a technician pulled up astonishing images of Tut on a computer screen. A grey a gray head took shape from a scattering of pixels, and the technician spun and tilted it in every direction. The neck vertebrae appeared as clearly as in an anatomy class. The other images revealed a hand, several views of the rib cage, and a transaction of the skull. But for now, the pressure was off. Sitting back in his chair, Zahi Hawass smiled, visibly relieved that nothing had gone wrong seriously. I didn't sleep last night, not for a second, he said. I was so worried, but now I think I can go and sleep. By the time we left the trailer, descending metal stairs to the sandy ground, the wind had stopped. The winter air lay cold and still, like death itself, in this valley of the departed. Just above the entrance to Tut's tomb stood Orion, the constellation that the Anishian Egyptians knew as the soul of the Osiris, the god of the afterlife, watching over the boy king. Source National Geography, Volume 207, Number 6. With this, the story comes to an end. Now it's time for some question and answers. Understanding the text. Question 1. Give reasons for the following. Bit 1. King Tut's body had been subjected to repeated scrutiny. Bit 2. Howard Carter's investigation was resented. Bit 3. Carter had to chisel away the solidified raisins to raise the king's remains. Bit 4. Tut's body was buried along with gilded treasures. Bit 5. The boy king 
changed his name from Tutan Khaten to Tutan Khamun. Question number two, bit number one. List the deeds that laid Ray Johnson to describe Akhil Natin as Waki. Bit two. What were the results of the city scan? Bit three. List the advances in technology that had improved forensic analysis. Bit four. Explain the statement. King Tut is one of the first mummies to be scanned in death as in life. Talking about the text. Discuss the following in groups of two pairs, each pair in a group, taking opposite points of view. Number 1. Scientific intervention is necessary to unearth buried mysteries. Question 2. Advanced technology gives us conclusive evidence of the past events. Question 3. Traditions, rituals and funerary practices must be respected. Question 4. Knowledge about the past is useful to complete our knowledge of the world we live in. Thinking about the language. Question 1. Read the following piece of information from the Encyclopedia of Language by David Crystal. Egyptian is now extinct. Its history dates from before the 3rd millennium BC preserved in many hieroglyphic inscriptions and papyrus manuscripts. Around the 2nd century AD, it developed into a language known as Coptic. Coptic mestia have been used as late as the early 19th century and is still used as a religious language by the Monophysite Christians in Egypt. Question 2. What do you think are the reasons for the extinction of the languages. Question 3. Do you think it is important to preserve languages? Question 4. In what ways do you think we could help prevent the extinction of languages and dialects? Working with words. Question 1. Given below, are some interesting combination of words. Explain why they have been used together. Number 1. Ghostly dust devils. 2. Desert sky. 3. Stunning artifacts. 4. Funerary treasures. 5. Scientific detachment. 6. Dark bellied clouds. 7. Casket Grey 8. Eternal Brilliance 9. Ritual Resins 10. Virtual Body Question 2. Here are some commonly used medical terms. Find out their meanings. City Scan Autopsy Postmortem MRI Dialysis Angiography, Tomography, ECG, Biopsy Things to do The constellation Orion is associated with the legend of Osiris, the god of afterlife. Find out the astronomical descriptions and legends associated with the following. Bit 1 Ursa Major, also known as Shaptarishi Mandal. Bit 2. Polaris, also known as 
ध्रुव तारा बिट थ्री पेगसिस ऑल्सो नोन एज विंग हॉर्स बिट फोर सीरियस ऑल्सो नोन एज डॉग स्टार बिट फाइव जेमिनी ऑल्सो नोन एज मिथुनिया क्वेश्चन नंबर टू सम ऑफ द लीव्स एंड फ्लावर्स मैंशन इन द पैसेज फॉर द अडोर्निंग the dead are willow olive celery lotus corn flower which of these are common in our country question number 3 name some leaves or and flowers that are used as adornments in our country so the chapter number 3 has a poem along with the story and the name of the poem is the laburnum top written by did hughes the laburnum top is silent quite still in the afternoon yellow september sunlight a few leaves yellowing all its seeds falling till the goldfinch comes with her twitching chirp a suddenness a startlement at the branch end then sleek as a lizard and alert and abrupt she enters the thickness and a machine starts up of chitterings and of tremor of wings and trillings the whole tree trembles and thrills it is the engine of her family she strokes it full then floats out to a branch end showing her bare face identity mask then with ere delicate whistle chirp whisperings she launches away towards the infinite and the laburnum subsides to empty meanings of some words laburnum a short tree with hanging branches yellow flowers and poisonous seeds goldfinch a small singing bird with yellow feathers on its wings now some question answers find out question 1 what laburnum is called in your language question 2 which local bird is like the goldfinch think it out question number 1 what do you notice about the beginning and the ending of the poem question 2 to what is the bird's movement compared what is the basis for the comparison question 3 why is the image of the engine evoked by the poet question 4 what do you like most about the poem question 5 what does the phrase her bared face identity mask mean note down number 1 the sound words number 2 the movement words number 3 the dominant color in the poem list the following number 1 words which describe sleek alert and abrupt number 2 words with the sound ch as in chat and tr as in trembles in the poem number 3 other sounds that occur frequently in the poem thinking about the language look for some other poem on a bird or a tree in english or any other language try this out write four lines in verse form on any tree 
that you see around you. Hornbill Chapter number 4 The Landscape of the Soul Written by Natalie Troveroy Notice these expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. Number 1. Ansidot Number 2. Delicate Realism Number 3. Figurative Painting Number 4. Illusionistic likeness. Number 5. Conceptual space. So the story starts. A wonderful old tale is told about the painter Udaozi who lived in 18th century. His last painting was a landscape commissioned by the Tang Emperor Zhuangzong to decorate a palace wall. The master had hidden his work behind a screen, so only the emperor would see it. For a long time, the emperor admired the wonderful scene, discovering forests, high mountains, waterfalls, clouds floating in an immense sky, men on hilly paths, birds in flight. Look, Shire, said the painter, in this cave, at the foot of the mountain, dwells a spirit. The painter clapped his hand and the entrance to the cave opened. The inside is splendid, beyond anything words can convey. Please let me show your majesty the way. The painter entered the cave, but the entrance closed behind him, and before the astonished emperor could move or utter a word, the painting had vanished from the wall. Not a trace of Udaozi's brush was left, and the artist was never seen again in the world. Such stories played an important part in China's classical education. The books of Confucius and Zhuangzi are full of them. They helped the master to guide his disciple in the right direction. Beyond Anisdot, they are deeply revealing of the spirit in which art was considered. Contrast this story or another famous one about a painter who didn't draw the eye of a dragon he had painted. For fear it would fly out of the painting. With an old story from my native Flanders that I find most representative of Western painting. In 15th century, Antwerp, a master blacksmith called Quintin Metzies, fell in love with a painter's daughter. The father would not accept a son-in-law in such a profession. So, Quintin sneaked into the painter's studio and painted a fly on his latest panel. With such a delicate realism that the master tried to swat it away before he realized what had happened. Quintet was immediately admitted as an apprentice into his studio. He married his beloved and went on to become one of the most famous painters of his age. These two stories illustrate what each form of art is trying to achieve a perfect illusionistic likeness in Europe, the essence of inner life and spirit in Asia. In the Chinese story, the emperor commissions a painting and appreciates its outer appearance, but 
the artist reveals to him the true meaning of his work. The emperor may rule over the territory he has conquered, but only the artist knows the way within. Let me show the way, the Tao, a word that means both the path or the method and the mysterious works of the universe. The painting is gone, but the artist has reached his goal beyond any material appearance. A classical Chinese landscape is not meant to reproduce an actual view as would a western figurative painting, whereas the European painter wants you to borrow his eyes and look at a particular landscape exactly as he saw it from a specific angle. The Chinese painter does not choose a single viewpoint. His landscape is not a real one. You can enter it from any point, then travel in it. The artist creates a path in your eyes to travel up and down and then back again in a leisurely movement. This is even more true in the case of the horizontal scroll in which the action of slowly opening one section of the painting, then rolling it up to move onto the other, adds a dimension of time which is unknown in any other form of painting. It also requires the active participation of the viewer who decides at what pace he will travel through the painting, a participation which is physical as well as mental. The Chinese painter does not want you to borrow his eyes. He wants you to enter his mind, the landscape in an inner one, a spiritual and a conceptual space. This concept is expressed as Shan Shui, literally mountain water, which used together represent the word landscape. More than two elements of an image, these represent two contemporary poles. Sorry, two complementary poles reflecting the Taoist view of the universe. The mountain is Yang, reaching vertically towards heaven, stable, warm and dry in the sun, while the water is Yin, horizontal and resting on the earth, fluid, moist and cool. The interaction of the Yin, the respective feminine aspect of universal energy and its counterpart Yang, active and masculine is of course a fundamental notion of Taoism. What is often overlooked is an essential third element, the middle void where their interaction takes place. This can be compared with the yogic practice of pranayama, breathe in, breathe in and breathe out. The suspension of breathe is the void where meditation occurs. The middle void is essential. Nothing can happen without it. Hence, the importance of the white, unpainted space in Chinese landscape. This is also where man finds a fundamental role. In that space between heaven and earth, he becomes the conduit of communication between poles of the universe. His presence is essential, even if it's only suggested, far from being lost or oppressed by the lofty peaks. He is, in Francois Cheng's wonderful expression, the eye of the landscape. This verse was an ex excerpt from Landscape of the Soul 
ethics and spirituality in Chinese paintings and is slightly edited. So now we have an article from Hindustan Times named as Getting Inside Outsider Art. It starts like this. When French painter Jean de Buffet mooted the concept of art brought in the 1940s, the art of the untrained visionary was of minority interest. From its almost veiled beginnings, outsider art has gradually become the fastest growing area of interest in contemporary art internationally. The genre is described as art of those who have no right to be artists as they have received no formal training, yet show talent and artistic insight. Their works are a stimulating contrast to a lot of mainstream offerings. Around the time Du Buffet was propounding his concept in India, an untutored genius was creating paradise. Years ago, the little patch of jungle that he began clearing to make himself a garden sculpted with stone and recycled material is known to the world today as the rock garden at Chandigarh. Its 80-year-old creator, director, Nick Chand, is now hailed as India's biggest contributor to outsider art. The 50th issue, Spring 2005, of Raw Vision, a UK-based magazine pioneer in outsider art publications, featured Nick Chand and his rock garden sculpture, Woman by the Waterfall, on its anniversary issues cover. The notion of art brought or raw art was of works that were in their raw state as regards cultural and artistic influences. Anything and everything from a tin to a sink to a broken down car could be a material for work of art, something Nick Chan has told to Dizzing Heights. Recognizing his art as an outstanding testimony of difference a single man can make when he lives his dream. The Swiss Commission for UNESCO will be honoring him by the way of an European exposition of his works. The five-month interactive show Realm of Nick Chan beginning October will be held at leading museums in Switzerland, Belgium, France and Italy. The biggest reward is walking through the garden and seeing people enjoy my creation, Nick Chan sees. By Brinda Sui from Hindustan Times, 20th August 2005. So, with this, the chapter comes to an end. Now, some question answer time. Understanding the text. Question number one, bit one. Contrast the Chinese view of an art with the European view with examples. Bit two. Explain the concept of Shan Shui. Question 2. Bit 1. What do you understand by the terms outsider art and art brought or raw art? Bit 2. Who was the untutored genius who created a paradise and what is nature of his contribution to art? Talking about the text, discuss the following statements in group of four. Question 1. The emperor may rule over the territory he has conquered, but only the artist knows the way within. 
क्वेश्चन टू द लैंडस्केप इज एन इनर वन अ स्पिरिचुअल एंड कॉन्सेप्शुअल स्पेस थिंकिंग अबाउट लैंग्वेज क्वेश्चन वन फाइंड आउट द को रिलेट्स ऑफ ईन एंड यंग इन अदर कल्चर्स क्वेश्चन टू वट इज द लैंग्वेज स्पोकन इन फ्लैंडरस वर्किंग विथ वर्ड्स द फॉलोइंग कॉमन वर्ड्स आर यूज इन मोर दैन वन सेंस पैनल एसेंस स्टूडियो मटेरियल ब्रश एग्जामिन द फॉलोइंग सेट्स ऑफ सेंटेंसेस टू फाइंड आउट वॉट द वर्ड्स पैनल एंड एसेंस मीन इन डिफरेंट कॉन्टेक्सट sentence number 1 bit 1 the masks from bawa village in mali look like long panels of decorated wood bit 2 judge h hobart grooms told the jury panel he had heard the reports bit 3 the panel is laying the groundwork for an international treaty bit 4 the glass panels of the windows are broken bit 5 through the many round tables workshops and panel discussions a consensus was reached bit 6 the sink in the hinged panel above the bunk drains into the head sentence 2 bit 1 their repetitive structure must have taught the people around the great composer the essence of music bit 2 part of the answer is in proposition but the essence is in the meaning bit 3 the implication of these schools of thought are of practical essence for the teacher bit 4 they had added vanilla essence to the pudding now find five sentences each for the rest of the words to show the different senses in which each of them is used noticing form point 1 a classical chinese landscape is not meant to reproduce an actual view as would a western figurative painting bit 2 whereas the european painter wants you to borrow his eyes and look at a particular landscape exactly as how he saw it from a specific angle the chinese painter does not choose a single viewpoint the above two examples are ways in which contrast may be expressed combine the following set of ideas to show the contrast between them example 1 bit 1 european art tries to achieve a perfect illusionistic likeness bit 2 asian art tries to capture the essence of inner life and spirit example 2 bit 1 the emperor commissions a painting and appreciates its outer appearance bit 2 the artist reveals to him the true meaning of his work example 3 bit 1 the emperor may rule over the territory he has conquered bit 2 the artist knows the way within things to do number 1 find out about as many indian schools of paintings you can write a short note on the distinctive features of each school point 2 find out about experiments in recycling that help in environmental conservations chapter number 4 has a poem along with the story and the name of the poem is the voice of the rain written by walt whitman so the poem starts 
and who art thou, said I, to the soft falling shower, which, strange to tell, gave me an answer as here translated. I am the poem of the earth, said the voice of the rain. Eternal I rise, impalpable out of the land and the bottomless sea, upward to heaven, whence vaguely formed altogether changed and yet the same. I descend to leave the draughts, atomies, dust layers of the globe, and all that in name without me were seeds only, latent, unborn, and forever by day and night I give back life to my own origin and make pure and beautify it. Bracket starts. For song, issuing from its birth place, after fulfillment, wandering, wrecked or unwrecked, duly with love returns. Bracket ends. With this, the poem comes to an end. Now, meaning of some words. Impalpable means something that cannot be touched. Lave means wash or bathe. Atomis means tiny particles. Latent means even. Now time for some question and answers. Think it out. Part 1. Question 1. There are two voices in the poem. Who do they belong to? Which lines indicate this? Question 2. What does the phrase strange to tell mean? Question 3. There is a parallel drawn between the rain and music. Which words indicate this? Explain the similarity between the two. Question 4. How is the cyclic movement of rain brought out in the poem? Compare it with what you have learned in science. Question 5. Why are the last two lines put within brackets? Question 6. List the pair of opposites found in the poem. Part 2. Notice the following sentence patterns. And who art thou? Said I to the soft falling shower. Question 2. I am the poem of the earth. Said the voice of the rain. Question 3. Eternal I rise. Question 4. For song, duly with love returns. Rewrite the above sentences in prose. Part 3. Look for some more poems on rain and see how this one is different from them. Hornbill, Chapter Number 5. The Ailing Planet. The Green Movement's Role Written by Nani Palkhiwala Notice these expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. 1. A holistic and ecological view. 2. Sustainable development. 3. Languish. 4. Ignominous darkness. 5. Inter alia, 6. Decimated, 7. Catastrophic depletion, 8. Transcending concern. So the story starts. The following article was written by Nani Palkhiwala and published in the Indian Express on 24 November 1994. The issues that he raised regarding the declining health of the earth continue to have relevance. One cannot recall any movement in world history which has gripped the imagination of the entire human race so completely and so rapidly as the green movement which started nearly 25 years ago. In 1972, 
the world's first nationwide green party was founded in new zealand since then the movement has not looked back we have shifted our hopes irrevocably from the mechanistic view to a holistic and ecological view of the world it is the shift in human perceptions as revolutionary as that introduced by copernicus who taught mankind in the 16th century that the earth and the other planets revolved round the sun for the first time in human history there is a growing worldwide consciousness that the earth itself is a living organism an enormous being of which we are part it has its own metabolic needs and vital processes which need to be respected and preserved the earth's vital signs reveal a patient in declining health we have begun to realize our ethical obligations to be good stewards of the planet and reasonable trustees of the legacy to future generations the concept of sustainable development was popularized in 1987 by the world commission on environment and development in its report it defined the idea as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs that is without stripping the natural world of resources future generations would need in the zoo at lusaka zambia there is a cage where the notice reads the world's most dangerous animal inside the cage there is no animal but a mirror where you see yourself thanks to the efforts of a number of agencies in different countries a new awareness has now dawned upon the most dangerous animal in the world he has realized the wisdom of shifting from a system based on domination to one based on partnership scientists have cataloged about 1.4 million living species which mankind shares on earth estimates vary widely as regards the still uncatalogued living species biologists reckon that about 3 to 100 million other living species still languish unnamed in ignominious darkness one of the early international commissions which dealt in their alia with the question of ecology and environment was the brant commission which had a distinguished indian as one of its members mr l k cha the first brant report raised the question as we are to leave our successors a scorched planet of advancing deserts impoverished landscapes and ailing environment mr lester r brown in his thoughtful book the global economic prospect points out that the earth's principal biological system are four fisheries forests grasslands and croplands and they form the foundation of the global economic system in addition to supplying our food these four systems provide virtually all the raw materials for the industries except minerals and petroleum derived synthetics in large areas of the world human claims on these systems are reaching an unsustainable level a point where their productivity 
is being impaired. When this happens, fisheries collapse, forests disappear, grasslands are converted into barren wastelands, and croplands deteriorate. In a protein-conscious and protein-hungry world, overfishing is common every day. In poor countries, local forests are being decimated in over to produce, procure firewood for cooking. In some places, firewood has become so expensive that what goes under the pot now costs more than what goes inside it. Since the tropical forest, in the words of Dr. Mayers, the powerhouse of evolution, several species of life face extinction as a result of its destruction. It has been well said that forests precede mankind, deserts follow. The world's ancient patrimony of tropical forest is now eroding at the rate of 40 to 50 million acres a year, and the growing use of dung for burning deprives the soil of an important natural fertilizer. The World Bank estimates that a five-fold increase in the rate of forest planting is needed to cope with the expected fuel load demanded in the year 2000. James Speth, the president of the World Resources Institute, said the other day, we were saying that we are losing the forest at an acre a second, but it is much closer to an acre and half to a second. Article 48A of the Constitution of India provides that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. But what causes endless anguish is the fact that laws are never respected nor enforced in India. In bracket, for instance, the constitution says that casticism, untouchability and bonded labor shall be abolished, but they flourish shamelessly even after 44 years of the operation of the constitution. A report, a recent report of our Parliament's Estimates Committee has highlighted the near catastrophic depletion of India's forests over the last four decades. India, according to reliable data, is losing its forest at the rate of 3.7 million acres a year. Large areas officially designated as forest land are already virtually treeless. The actual loss of forests is estimated to be about eight times the rate indicated by the government statistics. A three-year study using satellites and aerial photography conducted by United Nations warns that the environment has deteriorated so badly that it is crucial in many of the 88 countries investigated. There can be no doubt that the growth of world population is one of the strongest factors distorting the future of human society. It took mankind more than a million years to reach the first billion. That was the world population around the year 1800. By the year 1900, a second billion was added, and the 20th century has added another 3.7 billion. The present world population is estimated at 5.7 billion. Every four days, the world population increases by one million. Fertility falls 
as incomes rise. Education spreads and health improves. Thus, development is the best contraceptive. But develop itself may not be possible if the present increase in numbers continues. The rich gets richer and the poor beget children, which condemns them to remain poor. More children does not mean more workers, merely more people without work. It is not suggested that human beings be treated like cattle and compulsorily sterilized. But there is no alternative to voluntary family planning without introducing an element of co-erection. The choice is really between control of population and perceptuation of poverty. The population of India is estimated to be 920 million today, more than the entire populations of Africa and South America put together. No one familiar with the conditions in India would doubt that the hope of the people would die in their hungry hutments unless population control is given topmost priority. For the first time in human history, we see a transcending concern, a survival, not just of the people but of the planet. We have begun to take a holistic view of very basic of our existence. The environmental problem does not necessarily signal our demise. It is our passport for the future. The emerging new world vision has assured in the era of responsibility. It is a holistic view, an ecological view seeing the world as an integrated whole rather than a dissociated collection of parts. Industry has a most crucial role to play in this new era of responsibility. What a transformation would be effective if more businessmen shared the view of the chairman of DuPont, Mr. Edgar S. Ullard, who five years ago declared himself to be the company's chief environmental officer. He said, Our continued existence as a leading manufacturer requires that we excel in environmental performance. Of all the statements made by Margaret Thatcher during the years of her prime ministership, none of has passed so deceitfully into the current coin of English uses as her felicitous words. No generation has a freehold on this earth. All we have is a life tenancy with a full repairing lease. In the words of Mr. Lester Brown, we have not inherited this earth from our forefathers. We have borrowed it from our children. So with this, the chapter comes to an end. Now time for some question and answers. Understanding the text, question 1. Locate the lines in the text that support the title, The Ailing Planet. Question number 2. What does the notice, the world's most dangerous animal, at a case in this zoo, at Lusaka, Zambia, signify. Question number three. How are the Earth's principal biological systems being depleted? Question four. Why does the author aver that the growth of world population is one of the strongest factors distorting the future of human society? Talking about the text. Discuss in group of four. Number one. Laws are never respected nor enforced in India. Number two. Are we to leave our successors a scorched planet of advancing deserts? 
impoverished landscapes and an ailing environment? Number three, we have not inherited this earth from our forefathers. We have borrowed it from our children. Number four, the problems of overpopulation that directly affect our everyday life. Thinking about the language, the phrase inter alia, meaning among other things, is one of the many Latin expressions commonly used in English. Find out this Latin phrase's meaning. Number one, prima facie. Number two, ad hoc. Number three, in camera. Number four, ad infinitum. Number five, mutatis mutandis. Number six, caveat. Number seven, tabula rasa. Working with words. Number one, locate the following phases in the text and study their conno connotation. Number bit one, grip the imagination of. Bit two, dawned upon. Bit three, assured in. Bit four, passed into current point. Bit five, passport of the future. Question number two. The words grip, dawn, usher, coin, passport have a literal as well as figurative meaning. Write pairs of sentences using each word in the literal as well as the figurative sense. Things to do. Make posters to highlight the importance of the green movement. Number two. Maintain a record of the trees cut down and the parks demolished in your area or other act that violates the environment. Write to newspaper reporting on any such acts that disturb you. Hornbill, Chapter Number 6 The Browning Version Written by Terence Rattigan Notice these expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. Number one, remove. Two, slackers. Three, muck. Four, captain. Five, got carried away. Six, cut. Seven, saddest. Eight, shriveled up. So the story starts. This is an Excerpt from the Browning version. The scene is set in a school. Frank is young and Crocker Harris, middle-aged. Both are masters. Taplow is a boy of 16 who has come in to do extra work for Crocker Harris. But the latter has not yet arrived and Frank finds Taplow waiting. Frank, do I know you? Taplow, no sir. Frank, what's your name? Taplow, Taplow. Frank, Taplow, no I don't. You are not a scientist I gather. Taplow, no sir, I'm still in the lower fifth. I can't specialize until next term. That's to say, if I have got my remove all right. Frank, don't you know if you have got your remove? Taplow, no sir, Mr. Crocker Harris doesn't tell us the results like the other masters. Frank, why not? Taplow, well you know what he's like sir. Frank, I believe there is a rule that form results should only be announced by the headmaster on the last day of term. Taplow, yes, but who else pays attention to it except Mr. Crocker Harris? Frank, I don't. 
I admit, but that's no criterion. So you have got to wait until tomorrow to know your fate, have you? Kepler. Yes, sir. Frank. Supposing the answer is favorable, what then? Signed, sir, of course. Frank, in bracket, sadly. Yes, we caught all the slackers. Taplow, in bracket, protestingly. I'm extremely interested in science, sir. Frank, are you? I'm not. Not at least in the science I have to teach. Taplow, well, anyway, sir, it's a good deal. More exciting than this monk. In bracket, indicating his book. Frank. What is this monk? Taplow. It's Charles, sir. The Agamemnon. Frank. And your considered view is that the Agamemnon is monk? Taplow. Well, no, sir. I don't think the play is monk. Exactly. I suppose in a way. It's rather a good plot, really. A wife murdering her husband and all that. I only meant the way it's taught to us. Just a lot of Greek words strung together and 50 lines if you get them wrong. Frank, you sound a little bitter, Taplo. Taplo, I am rather, sir. Frank, Captain, a... Uh, Taplow. No, sir. Extra work. Frank. Extra work? On the last day of school? Taplow. Yes, sir. And I might be playing golf. You would think you would have enough to do anyway, Hansel, considering he's leaving tomorrow for good. But, oh no. I missed a day last week when I was ill. So here I am. And look at the weather, sir. Frank, bad luck. Still, there's one comfort. You are pretty well certain to get your remove tomorrow for being a good boy and taking extra work. Taplow, well, I'm not sure, sir. That would be true of the ordinary masters, all right. They just wouldn't dare not to give a chap a remove after he's taking extra work. But those sort of rules don't apply to the croc. Mr. Crocker Harris, I asked him yesterday outright if he would give me a remove. And do you know what he said, sir? Frank, no. What? Taplow. In bracket. Imitating a very gentle, rather throaty voice. My dear Tablo, I have given you exactly what you deserve. No less and certainly no more. Do you know, sir, I think he may have marked me down rather than up for taking extra work. I mean, the man, hardly human. He breaks off quickly. Sorry, sir. Have I gone too far? Frank. Yes, much too far. Tablo. Sorry, sir. I got carried away. Frank. Evidently. He picks up a newspaper and opens it. A uh, Tablo. Tablo. Yes, sir. Frank. What was that Crocker Harris said to you? Just uh, repeat it, would you? Taplow. Imitating again. My dear Taplow, I have given you exactly what you deserve. No less and certainly no more. Frank. Looking severe. Not in the least like you. Read your nice as shall is and be quiet. Taplow. But this time. As shall is. 
time. Look, what time did Mr. Crocker Harris tell you to be here? Time. 6.30, sir. Time. Well, he's 10 minutes late. Why don't you cut? You could still play golf before lock-up. Captain, really shocked. Oh no, I couldn't cut. Cut the clock? Mr. Crocker Harris? I shouldn't think it's ever been done in the whole time he's been here. God knows what would happen if I did. He would probably follow me home or something. Frank, I must admit, I envy him the effect he seems to have on you boys in the fog. You all seem scared to death of him. What does he do? Bit you all or something? Captain, good lord, no. He's not a sadist like one or two of the others. Frank, I beg your pardon? Captain, a sadist, sir, is someone who gets pleasure out of giving pain. Frank, indeed. But I think you went on to say that some other masters? Captain, well, of course, they are, sir. I won't mention names. But you know them as well as I do. Of course I know most masters think we boys don't understand a thing. But sir, you are different. You are young. Well, comparatively, anyway, and you are science. You must know what sadism is. Frank, after a pause. Good Lord, what are our schools coming to? Chaplin. Anyway, the croc isn't a sadist. That's what I'm saying. He wouldn't be so frightening if he were. Because at least it would show he had some feelings. But he hasn't. He's all shriveled up inside like a nut. And he seems to get people to like him. It's funny. That I don't know any other master who doesn't like Light. Frank, and I don't know any boy who doesn't use that for his own purposes. Chaplin, well, it's natural, sir, but not with the croc. Frank, Mr. Crocker Harris. Chaplin, Mr. Crocker Harris, the funny thing is that, in spite of everything, I do rather like him. I can't help it. And sometimes I think he sees it and that seems to shrivel him up even more. Frank, I'm sure you're exaggerating. Captain, no sir, I'm not. In form, the other day he made one of his classical jokes. Of course, nobody laughed because nobody understood it, myself included. Still, I mean, he would meant it. As funny, so I laughed. Out of ordinary common politeness and feeling a bit sorry for him for having made a poor joke. Now I can't remember what the joke was, but suppose I make it. Now you laugh, sir. In bracket, Frank laughs. Chaplo in a gentle, throaty voice. Chaplo, you laugh. At my rural joke, I noticed, I must confess, that I am pleased at the advance your Latin has made, since you were so readily have understood what the rest of the form did not. Perhaps, now you would be good enough to explain it to them, so that they too can share your pleasure. The door upright is pushed open. And Lily Crocker Harris enters. She is a thin woman in her late thirties, rather more smartly dressed than the general run of schoolmasters' wives. She is wearing a cape and carries a shopping basket. She closes the door and then stands by the screen watching Taplow and Frank. 
It is a few seconds before the note is heard. Frank. Come along, Chapto. Racket. Moves slowly above the desk. Racket chooses. Do not be so selfish as to keep a good joke to yourself. Tell the others. He wakes up suddenly noticing the needle. Oh Lord. Frank turns quickly and seems infinitely relieved at seeing him again. Frank. Oh hello. Millie. Without expression. Hello. In racket, she comes down to the sideboard and puts her basket on it. Tap to. Racket starts. Moving up to left of Frank, whispering Frank to her. Bracket closes. Do you think she heard? Frank, in bracket, shakes his head comfortingly. Millie takes off for it, coat, and hangs it on her hall stand. Bracket closes. I think she did. She was standing there quite a time. Tap to. If she did, and tells me, there goes my window. Frank, nonsense. Bracket starts. He crosses to the fireplace. Bracket closes. Millie takes the basket from the sideboard, moves above the table and puts the basket on it. Millie, to tap to. Waiting for my husband? Tap to. Bracket, moving down left of the table. Bracket closes. Uh, yes, Millie. He's at the Versailles and might be there quite a time. If I were you, I would go. Tap to. Bracket starts. Doubtful. Bracket ends. He said most particularly I was to come. Millie. Well, why don't you run away for a quarter of an hour and come back? Bracket starts. She unpacks. Some things from the basket. Bracket closes. Tap low. Supposing he gets here before me? Millie. Smile. I'll take the blame. Bracket starts. She takes a prescription out of the basket. Bracket closes. I'll tell you what. You can do a job for him. Take this prescription to the chemist and get it made up. Tap low. All right. Mrs. Crocker Harris. Bracket starts. He closes. Sorry. He crosses towards the door upright. Bracket ends. So with this, the story comes to an end. Now time for some question and answer. Understanding the text. Question 1. Comment on the attitude shown by Taplow towards Crocker Harris. Question number 2. Does Frank seem to encourage Taplow's comments on Crocker Harris? Question number three. What do you gather about Crocker Harris from the play? Talking about the text. Discuss with your partners. Point one. Talking about features among friends. Point two. The manner you adopt when you talk about a teacher to other teachers. Point three. Reading plays is more interesting than studying science. Working with words. A sadist is a person who gets pleasure out of giving pain to others. Given below are some dictionary definitions of certain kinds of persons. Find out the words that fit these descriptions. Number one, a person who considers it very important that things should be correct or genuine. Example, in the use of language or in the arts. And the word starts with P. Number two, a person who believes that war and violence are wrong and will not fight in a war. The word starts with P. Number three, a person who believes that nothing really exists. The word starts with N. Number four, a person who is always open and 
and expects the best and all things. The word starts with O. Point five. A person who follows generally accepted norms of behavior. The word starts with C. Number six. A person who believes that material possessions are all that matter in life. And the word starts with M. Things to do. Based on the text, enact your own version of the play and work in pairs. The chapter 6 has a poem along with the story and the name of the poem is Childhood. It is written by Marcus Natten. So the poem starts. When did my childhood go? Was it the day I ceased to be 11? Was it the time I realized that hell and heaven could not be found in geography? And therefore could not be. Was that the day? Stanza 2 When did my childhood go? Was it the time I realized that adults were not all they seemed to be? They talked of love and preached of love but did not act so lovingly. Was that the day? Stanza 3 When did my childhood go? Was it when I found my mind was really mine? To use whichever way I choose? Producing thoughts that were not those of other people, but my own and mine alone? Was that the day? Stanza 4 where did my childhood go? It went to some forgotten place that's hidden in an infant's face. That's all I know. So with this, the poem comes to an end. Now time for some question and answer. Think it out. Question 1. Identify the stanza that talks of each of the following. Individuality, rationalism, hypocrisy. Question 2. What according to the poem is involved in the process of growing up? Question 3. What is the poet's feeling towards childhood? Question 4. What do you think are the most poetic lines? Why? Hornbill, Chapter Number Seven, The Adventure, written by Jayant Narlikar. Notice these expressions in the text. Infer their meaning from the context. One, blow by blow account. Two, moral booster. Three, relegated to. Four, political acumen. Five. De facto. 6. Astute. 7. Doctored accounts. 8. Gave vent to. The Jijamata Express spread along the Pune Bombay route considerably faster than the Deccan Queen. There were no industrial townships outside Pune. The first stop, Lonaula, came in 40 minutes. The guard section that followed was no different from what he knew. The train stopped at Karjat only briefly and went on at even greater speed. It rode through Kalyan. Meanwhile, the racing mind of Professor Gaitonde had arrived at a plan of action in Bombay. Indeed, as a historian, he felt he should have thought of it sooner. He would go to a big library and browse through history books. That was the surest way of finding out how the present state of affairs 
was reached. He also planned eventually to return to Pune and have a long talk with Rajendra Deshpande, who would surely help him understand what had happened. That is, assuming that in this world there existed someone called Rajendra Deshpande. The train stopped beyond the long tunnel. It was a small station called Sarhad. An Anglo-Indian in uniform went through the train checking permits. This is where the British Raj begins. You are going for the first time, I presume? Khan Sahib asked. Yes, the reply was factually correct. Gangadhar Pant had not been to this Bombay before. He ventured a question and Khan Sahib, How will you go to Peshwar? This train goes to the Victoria Terminus. I will take the Frontier Mail tonight out of the Central. How far does it go? By what route? Bombay to Delhi, then to Lahore, and then Peshwar. A long journey. I will reach Peshwar the day after tomorrow. Thereafter, Khan Sahib spoke a lot about his business and Gangadhar Pant was a willing listener. For in that way, he was able to get some flavor of life in this India that was so different. The train now passed through the suburban rail traffic. The blue carriages carried the letters GBMR on the side. Greater Bombay Metropolitan Railway, explained Khan Sahib. See the tiny Union Jack painted on each carriage? A gentle reminder that we are in British territory. The train began to slow down beyond the Dar and stopped only at its destination, Victoria Terminus. The station looked remarkably neat and clean. The staff was mostly made up of Anglo-Indians and Parsis along with a handful of British officers. As he emerged from the station, Gangadhar Pant found himself facing an imposing building. The letters on it proclaimed its identity to those who did not know this Bombay landmark. East India House Headquarters of the East India Company Prepared as he was for many shocks, Professor Gaiton Day had not expected this. The East India Company had been owned up shortly after the events of 1857. At last, that is what history books said. Yet, here it was, not only alive but flourishing. So, history had taken a different turn, perhaps before 1857. How and when had it happened? He had to find out. As he walked along Hornby Road, as it was called, he found a different set of shops and office buildings. There was no handloom house building. Instead, there were booths and Woolworth departmental stores, imposing offices of Lloyd's, Barclays and other British banks as in a typical high street of a town in England. He turned right along Home Street and entered Forbes Building. I wish to meet Mr. Binoy Gaitonde, please. He said to the English receptionist. She searched through the telephone list, the staff list and then through the directory of employees of all the branches of the firm. She shook her head and said, I'm afraid I can't find anyone of that name either here or in any of our branches. Are you sure? 
he words here this was a blow not totally unexpected if he himself were dead in this world what guarantee had he that his son would be alive indeed he may not even have been born he thanked the girl politely and came out it was characteristic of him not to worry about where he would stay his main concern was to make his way to the library of the asiatic society to solve the riddle of history grabbing a quick lunch at a restaurant he made his way to the town hall yes to his relief the town hall was there and it did house the library he entered the reading room and asked for a list of history books including his own his five volumes duly arrived on his table he started from the beginning volume 1 took the history up to the period of ashoka volume 2 up to samudragupta volume 3 up to mohammad ghori and volume 4 up to the death of aurangzeb up to this period history was as he knew it the change evidently had occurred in the last volume reading volume 5 from both ends in words gangadhar pant finally converged on the precise moment where history had taken a different turn that page in the book dex- described the battle of panipat and it mentioned that the marathas won it handsomely abdali was routed and he was chased back to kabul by the triumphant maratha army led by shadashiv rao bhau and his nephew the young vishwas rao the book did not go into a blow by blow account of the battle itself rather it elaborated in detail its consequences for the power struggle in india gangadhar pant read through the account avidly the style of writing was unmistakably his yet he was reading the account for the first time their victory in the battle was not only a great moral booster to the marathas but it also established their supermacy in northern india the east india company which had been watching this developments from the sidelines got the message and temporarily shelved its expansionist program for the peshwas the immediate result was an increase in the influence of bhau sahib and bishwas rao who eventually succeeded his father in 1780 ad the trouble maker dada sahib was relegated to the background and he eventually retired from state politics to its dismay the east india company met its match in the new maratha ruler vishwas rao he and his brother madhav rao combined political acumen with valor and systematically exp- expanded their influence all over india the company was reduced to pockets of influence near bombay calcutta and madras just like its european rivals the portuguese and the french for political reasons the peshwas kept the puppet mughal regime alive in delhi in the 19th century these de facto rulers from pune were astute enough to recognize the importance of the technological age dawning in europe they set up their own centers for science and technology here the east india company saw another opportunity to extend its influence it offered aid and exports they were accepted only to make the local centers self sufficient the 20th century 
brought about further changes inspired by the West. India moved towards a democracy. By then, the Peshwas had lost their enterprise and they were gradually replaced by democratically elected bodies. The Sultanate at Delhi survived even this transition, largely because it wielded no real influence. The Shahanshah of Delhi was no more than a figurehead to rubber stamp the recommendations made by the central parliament. As he read on, Gangadhar Panth began to appreciate the India he had seen. It was a country that had not been subjected to slavery for the white man. It had learnt to stand on its feet and knew what self-respect was. From a position of strength and for purely commercial reasons, it had allowed the British to remain Bombay as the sole outpost on the subcontinent. That lease was to expire in year 2001 according to the Treaty of 1908. Gangadhar Panth could not help comparing the country he knew with what he was witnessing around him. But at the same time he felt that his investigations were incomplete. How did the Marathas win the battle? To find the answer, he must look for accounts of battle itself. He went through the books and journals before him. At last, among the books, he found one that gave the clue. It was Bhau Sahe Banchi Bakhar. Although he seldom relied on the Bakars for historical evidence, he found them entertaining to read, sometimes buried in the graphic, but doctored accounts, he could spot the germ of truth. He found one now in a three-line account of how close Vishwas Rao had come to being killed. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God was merciful. A short brust passed his ear, even the difference of a till and bracket sesame would have led to his death. At eight o'clock, the librarian politely reminded the professor that the library was closing for the day. Gangadhar Panth emerged from his thoughts. Looking around, he noticed that he was the only reader left in that magnificent hall. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, sir. May I request you to keep these books here for my use tomorrow morning? By the way, when do you open? At 8 o'clock, sir, the librarian smiled. Here was a user and researcher right after his heart. As the professor, he left the table, he shoved some notes into his right pocket. Absent-mindedly, he also shoved the bakar into his pocket. He found a guest house to stay in and had a frugal meal. He then set out for a stroll towards the Azad Maidan. In the Maidan, he found a throng moving towards a pandal. So, a lecture was to take place. Force of habit took Professor Gaitonde towards the pandal. The lecture was in progress. All the people kept coming and going. But Professor Gaitonde was not looking at the audience. He was staring at the platform as if mesmerized. There was a table and chair, but the latter was unoccupied. The presidential chair unoccupied? The sight stirred him to the depths. 
like a piece of iron attracted to a magnet. He swiftly moved towards the chair. The speaker stopped in mid-sentence, too shocked to continue. But the audience soon found voice. Vacate the chair. This lecture series has no chairperson. Away from the platform, mister. The chair is symbolic, don't you know? What nonsense! Whoever heard of a public lecture without a presiding dignitary? Professor Gaiton Day went to the mic and gave vent to his views. Ladies and gentlemen, an unshared lecture is like Shakespeare's Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Let me tell you. But the audience was in no mood to listen. Tell us nothing. We are sick of remarks from the chair, a vote of thanks, of long introductions. We only want to listen to the speaker. We abolished the old custom, sorry, customs long ago. Keep the platform empty, please. But Gangadhar Pant had the experience of speaking at 999 meetings and had faced the Pune audience at its most hostile. He kept on talking. He soon became target for shower of tomatoes, eggs and other objects. But he kept on trying valiantly to correct this sacrilege. Finally, the audience swarmed to the stage to eject him bodily. And in the crowd, Gangadhar Pant was nowhere to be seen. That is all I have to tell, Rajendra. All I know is that I was found in the Azad Maidan in the morning, but I was back in the world I am familiar with. Now where exactly did I spend those two days when I was absent from here? Rajendra was dumbfounded by the narrative. It took him a while to reply. Professor, before just prior to your collision with the truck, what were you doing? Rajendra asked. I was thinking of the catastrophic theory and its implications for history. Right, I thought so. Rajendra smiled. Don't smile smugly, in case you think that it was just my mind playing tricks and my imagination running amok. Look at this. And triumphantly, Professor Gaitonde produced his vital piece of evidence, a page torn out of a book. Rajendra read the text on the printed page and his face underwent a change. Gone was the smile and its place came a grave expression. He was visibly moved. Gangadhar Pant praised home his advantage. I had inadvertently slipped the bakhar into my pocket as I left the library. I discovered my error when I was paying for my meal. I had intended to return it the next morning, but it seems that in the melee of Azad Madan, the book was lost. Only this torn off page remained, and luckily for me, the page contains vital evidence. Rajendra again read the page. It described how Vishwas Rao narrowly missed the bullet, and how that event taken as an omen by Maratha army, turned the tide in their favour. Now look at this. Gangadhar Pant produced his own copy of Bhau Sahib Banshi Bakhar, opened at the relevant page, the Count ran thus. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee, where the elite troops were fighting, and he attacked them and God expressed his displeasure. He was hit by the bullet. Professor Gaitonde, you have given me food for thought. 
until I saw this material evidence. I had simply put your experience down to fantasy. But facts can be stronger than fantasies. As I am beginning to realize. Facts. What are facts? I am dying to know, Professor Gaitonde said. Rajendra motioned him to silence and started pacing the room, obviously under great mental strain. Finally, he turned around and said, Professor Gaitonde, I will try to rationalize your experience on the basis of two scientific theories as known today. Whether I succeed or not in convincing you of the facts, only you can judge. For you have indeed passed through a fantastic experience, or more correctly, a catastrophic experience. Please continue, Rajendra. I am all ears. Professor Gaitonde replied. Rajendra continued pacing as he talked. You have heard a lot about the catastrophe theory at the seminar. Let us apply it to the Battle of Panipat. Wars fought face to face on open grounds offer excellent examples of this theory. The Maratha army was facing Abdali's troops on the field of Panipat. There was no great disparity between the latter's troops and the opposing forces. Their armor was comparable, so a lot depended on the leadership and the moral of the troops. The juncture at which Vishwasrao, the son of and heir to the Peshwa, had killed, proved to be the turning point. As history has it, his uncle, Bhau Saheb, rushed into the melee and was never seen again. Whether he was killed in battle or survived is not known, but for the troops at that particular moment, that blow of losing their leaders was crucial. They lost their moral and fighting spirit. There followed an utter rot. Exactly, Professor, and what you have shown me on that torn page is the course taken by the battle. When the bullet missed the Shwasrao, a crucial event gone the other way, and its effect on the troops was also the opposite. It boosted their moral and provided just that extra impetus that made all the difference, Rajendra said. Maybe so. Similar statements are made about the Battle of Waterloo, which Napoleon could have won. But we live in a unique world which has a unique history. This idea of it might has been is okay for the sake of speculation, but not for reality, Gangadhar Pant said. I take issue with you there. In fact, that brings me to my second point, which you may find strange. But please, hear me out, Rajendra said. Gangadhar Pant listened expectantly as Rajendra continued. What do you mean by reality? We experienced it directly with our senses or indirectly by our instruments. But it is limited to what we see, does it have other manifestations? That reality may not be unique has been found from experiments on very small systems of atoms and their constituent particles. When dealing with such systems, the physicist discovered something startling. The behavior of these systems cannot be predicted Definitively, even if all the physical laws governing the systems are known. Take an example. I fire an electron from a source. 
where will it go if i fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed i know where it will be at the later time but i cannot make such an assertion for the electron it may be here there anywhere i can at best quote odds for it being found in a specified location at a specified time the lack of determinism in quantum theory even an ignoramus historian like me has heard of it professor gaiton de said so imagine many world pictures in one world the electron is found here in another it is over there in another it is in a still different location once the observer finds where it is we know which world we are talking about but all those alternative worlds could exist just the same rajendra paused to marshal his thoughts but is there any contact between these many worlds professor gaiton de asked yes and no imagine two worlds for example in both an electron is orbiting the nucleus of an atom like planets around the sun gangadhar pant interjected not quite we know the precise trajectory of planet the electron could be orbiting in any of a large number of specified states the states may be used to identify the world in state number 1 we have the electron in a state of higher energy in state number 2 it is in a state of lower energy it can make a jump from high to low energy and send out a pulse of radiation or a pulse of radiation can knock it off out of state number 2 into state number 1 such transitions are common in microscopic systems what if it happened on a macroscopic label rajendra said i get you you are suggesting that i made a transition form sorry from one world to another and back again gangadhar pant asked fantastic though it seems this is the only explanation i can offer my theory is that catastrophic situations offer radically different alternatives for the world to proceed it seems that so far as reality is concerned all alternatives are viable but the observer can experience only one of them at a time by making a transition you were able to experience two worlds although one at a time the one you live in now and the one where you spent two days one has a history we know the other a different history the separation of bifurcation took place in the battle of panipat you neither travel to the past nor to the future yet were in the present but experiencing a different world of course by the same token there must be many more different worlds arising out of bifurcations at different points of time as rajendra concluded gangadhar pant asked the question that was beginning to bother him most but why did i make the transition if i knew the answer i would solve a greater problem unfortunately there are many unsolved questions in science and this is one of them but that does not stop me from guessing rajendra smiled and proceeded you need some interaction to cause a transition perhaps 
at the time of the collision, you were thinking about the catastrophe theory and its role in wars. Maybe you were wondering about the Battle of Panipat. Perhaps the neurons in your brain acted as a trigger. A good guess I was indeed wondering what course history would have taken if the result of the battle had gone the other way. Professor Gaitonde said, That was going to be the topic of my thousandth presidential address. Now, you are in the happy position of recounting your real-life experience rather than just speculating. Rajendra laughed, but Gangadhar Pant was grave. No, Rajendra, my thousandth address was made on the Azad Maidan when I was so rudely interrupted. No, the Professor Gaitonde who disappeared while defending his chair on the platform will now never be seen presiding at another meeting. I have conveyed my regrets to the organizers of the Panipat seminar. So with this, the chapter comes to an end. Now time for some questions. Understanding the text. Number one, take the statements that are true. Bit 1. The story is an account of real events. Bit 2. The story hinges on a particular historical event. Bit 3. Rajendra Deshpande was a historian. Bit 4. The places mentioned in the story are all imaginary. Bit 5. The story tries to relate history to science. Question number two. Briefly explain the following statements from the text. One. You neither travelled to the past nor the future. You were in the present experiencing a different world. Number two. You have passed through a fantastic experience or more correctly a catastrophic experience. Three. Gangadhar Pant could not help comparing the country he knew with what he was witnessing around him. 4. The lack of determinism in quantum theory. 5. You need some interaction to cause a transition. Talking about the text. Question 1. Discuss the following statements in group of two pairs, each pair in a group taking opposite points of view. Bit 1. A single event may change the course of the history of a nation. Bit 2. Reality is what directly experienced through the senses. Bit 3. The methods of inquiry of history, science and philosophy are similar. Question 2. Bit 1. The story is called The Adventure. Compare it with the adventure described in We Are Not Afraid to Die. Bit 2. Why do you think Professor Gaitonde decided never to preside over meetings again? Thinking about language. Number 1. In which language do you think Gangadhar Pant? and Khan Sahib talked to each other. Which language did Gangadhar Pant use to talk to the English receptionist? Question 2. In which language do you think Bhav Sahib Banchi Bakhar was written? Question 3. There is mention of three communities in the story, the Marathas, the Mughals, the Anglo-Indians. Which language do you think they used within their communities and while speaking to other groups? Question 4. Do you think that the ruled always adopt the language of the ruler? Working with words. Part 1. 
टेक द आइटम दैट इज क्लोजेस्ट इन मीनिंग टू द फॉलोइंग फ्रेजेस वन टू टेक इशू विथ द ऑप्शन आर बिट वन टू एक्सेप्ट बिट टू टू डिस्कस बिट थ्री टू डिसग्री बिट फोर टू एड नंबर टू टू गिव वेंट टू द ऑप्शन आर बिट वन टू एक्सप्रेस बिट टू टू एम्फसाइज बिट थ्री सप्रेस बिट फोर डिसमिस नंबर थ्री टू स्टैंड ऑन वंस फीट द ऑप्शन आर बिट वन टू बी फिजिकली स्ट्रॉन्ग बिट टू टू बी इंडिपेंडेंट बिट थ्री टू स्टैंड इरेक्ट बिट फोर टू बी सक्सेसफुल नंबर फोर टू बी ओन्ड अप द ऑप्शन आर बिट वन टू बिकम एक्टिव बिट टू टू स्टॉप ऑपरेटिंग बिट थ्री टू बी ट्रांसफॉर्म्ड बिट फोर टू बी डिस्ट्रॉयड फाइव टू मीट वंस मैच द ऑप्शन आर बिट वन टू मीट अ पार्टनर हु हैज सिमिलर टेस्ट बिट टू टू मीट एन ओपोनेंट बिट थ्री to meet someone who is equally able as one self bit 4 to meet defeat part 2 distinguish between the following pairs of sentences 1 bit 1 he was visibly moved bit 2 he was visually impaired question 2 bit 1 green and black stripes were used alternately bit 2 green stripes could be used or alternatively black ones 3 bit 1 the team played the two matches successfully bit 2 the team played two matches successively 4 bit 1 the librarian spoke respectfully to the learned scholar bit 2 you will find the historian and the scientist in the archaeology and natural science sections of the museum respectively noticing form the story deals with unreal and hypothetical conditions some of the sentences used to express these notions are given below one if i fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed i know where it will be at a later time Two, if I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. But sorry, three, if he himself were dead in this world, what guarantee had he that his son would be alive? Four, what course would history have taken if the battle had gone the other way? Notice that in an unreal condition, it is clearly expected. that the condition will not be fulfilled things to do read the following passage on catastrophe theory downloaded from the internet originated by the french mathematician rene thom in 1960s catastrophe theory is a special branch of dynamical system theory it studies and classifies phenomena characters characterized by sudden shifts in behavior arising from small changes in circumstances catastrophes are bifurcations between different equilibria or fixed point attractors due to their restricted nature catastrophes can be classified on the basis of how many control parameters are being simultaneously varied For example, if there are two controls, then one finds the most common type called a cusp catastrophe. If, however, there are more than 5 controls, there is no classification. Catastrophe theory has been applied to a number of different phenomena such as the stability of ships at sea and their capsizing, bridge collapse, and with some less convincing success the flight or fight behavior of animals and prison riots part 2 look up the internet or an encyclopedia for information on the following theories 
bit 1 quantum theory bit 2 theory of relativity bit 3 big bang theory bit 4 theory of evolution hornbill chapter number 8 silk road written by nick middleton notice these expressions in the text infer their meaning from the context 1 ducking back 2 maneuvers 3 bellowed 4 swag 5 cairn of rocks 6 carried down 7 salt flats so the story begins a flawless half moon floated in a perfect blue sky on the morning we said our goodbyes extended banks of cloud like long french loaves glowed pink as the sun emerged to splash the distant mountain tops with a rose scented blush now that we were leaving ravu lamo said she wanted to give me a farewell present one evening i had told her through daniel that i was heading towards mount kalash to complete the kora and she had said that i ought to get some warmer clothes after ducking back into her tent she emerged carrying one of the long-sleeved sheepskin coats that all the men wore Satan sized me up as we clambered into his car ah yes he declared drogba sir we took a shortcut to get off the changtang Satan knew a route that would take us southwest almost directly towards mount kalash it involved crossing several fairly high mountains passes he said but no problem sir he assured us if there is no snow what was the likelihood of that i asked not knowing sir until we get there from the gently rolling hills of Ravu, the shortcut took us across vast open plains with nothing in them except a few gazelles that would look up from nibbling the arid pastures and frown before bounding away into the void. Further on, where the plains became more stony than grassy a great herd of wild ass came into view shitan told us we were approaching them long before they appeared kang he said pointing towards a far off pall of dust when we drew near i could see the herd galloping en masse wheeling and turning in tight formation as if they were practicing maneuvers on some predetermined course plumes of dust billowed into the crisp clean air as heels started to push up once more from the rocky wilderness we passed solitary drop bars tending their flocks sometimes men sometimes women these well-wrapped figures would pause and stare at our car occasionally waving as we passed when the track took us close to their animals the ship would take evasive action veering away from the speeding vehicle we passed nomads dark tents pitched in splendid isolation usually with a huge black dog 
a Tibetan mastiff, standing guard. These beasts would cock their great big heads when they become aware of our approach and fix us in their sights. As we continued to draw closer, they would explode into action, speeding directly towards us like a bullet from a gun and nearly as fast. These shaggy monsters, blacker than the darkest night, usually wore bright red collars and barked furiously with massive jaws. They were completely fearless of our vehicle, shooting straight into our path, causing Satan to break and swerve. The dog would make chase for a hundred meters or so before easing off, having seen us off the property. It wasn't difficult to understand why ferocious Tibetan mastiffs became popular in China's imperial courts as hunting dogs, brought along the Silk Road in ancient times as tribute from Tibet. By now, we could see snow-capped mountains gathering on the horizon. We entered a valley where the river was white and mostly clogged with ice, brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine. The trail hugged its bank, twisting with the mandiers as we gradually gained height and the valley sides closed in. The turns became sharper and the right bumpier. Shitan now in third gear as we continued to climb. The track moved away from the icy river, levering through steeper slopes that sported big rocks daubed with patches of bright orange lichen. Beneath the rocks, hunks of snow clung on in the near permanent shade. I felt the pressure building up in my ears, held my nose, snorted and cleared them. We struggled round another tight bend and Shitan stopped. He had opened his door and jumped out of his seat before I realized what was going on. Snow, said Daniel, as he too excited existed the vehicle, letting in a breath of cold air as he did so. A swath of the white stuff lay across the track in front of us, stretching for maybe 15 meters before it pittered out and the dirt trail reappeared. The snow continued on either side of us, smoothing the abrupt bank on the upslope side. The bank was too steep for our vehicle to scale, so there was no way round the snow patch. I joined Daniel as Sitan stepped onto the encrusted snow and began to slither and slide forward, stamping his foot from time to time to ascertain how sturdy it was. I looked at my wristwatch. We were at 5,210 meters above sea level. The snow didn't look too deep to me, but the danger wasn't its depth, Daniel said, so much as its icy top layer. If we sleep off, the car could turn over, he suggested, as we saw Sitan grab handfuls of dirt and filling them across the frozen surface. We both pitched in and when the snow was spread with soil, Daniel and I stared out of the vehicle to lighten Sitan's load. He backed up and drove towards the dirty snow, eased the car on its icy surface and slowly drove its length without apparent difficulty. Ten minutes later, we stopped at another blockage. 
Not good, sir, Shitan announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene. This time he decided to try and dri- drive round the snow. The slope was stiff and studded with major rocks, but somehow Sitan negotiated them. His four wheel drive vehicle lurching from one obstacle to the next. In so doing, he cut off one of the hairpin bends, regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted. I checked my watch again as we continued to climb in the bright sunshine. We crept past 5,400 meters and my head began to throb horribly. I took gulps from my water bottle, which is supposed to help me a rapid ascent. We finally reached the top of the pass at 5,515 meters. It was marked by a large cairn of rocks festooned with white silk scarves and ragged prayer flags. We all took a turn round the cairn in the clockwise direction as in the tradition. And Sitan checked the tires of his vehicle. He stopped at the petrol tank and partially unscrewed the top, which emitted a loud hiss. The lower atmospheric pressure was allowing the fuel to expand. It sounded dangerous to me. Maybe, sir, Sitan laughed, but no smoking. My headache soon cleared as we carried down the other side of the pass. It was two o'clock by the time we stopped for the lunch. We ate hot noodles inside a long canvas tent, part of a work camp erected beside a dry salt lake. The plateau is pockmarked with salt flats and brackish lakes. Vestiges of the Tethys Ocean, which bordered Tibet before the great continental collision that lifted it skywards. This one was a hive of activity. Men with picks pickaxes and shovels trudging back and forth in their long sheepskin coats and salt encrusted boots. All wore sunglasses against the glare as a steady stream of blue trucks emerged from the blindingly white lake laden with piles of salt. By late afternoon we had reached the small town of Hall, back on the main east-west highway that followed the old tread route from Lhasa to Kashmir. Daniel, who was returning to Lhasa, found a ride in a truck, so Sitan and I bade him farewell outside a tire repair shop. We had suffered two punctures in quick succession on the drive down from the salt lake and Sitan was eager to have them fixed since they left him with no spares. Besides, the second tire he had changed had been replaced by one that was as smooth as my bald head. Hor was a green, miserable place. There was no vegetation whatsoever just dust and rocks, liberally scattered with years of accumulated refuse, which was unfortunate given that the town sat on the shore of Lake Mansarovar, Tibet's most venerated stretch of water. Ancient Hindu and Buddhist cosmology pinpoints Mansarovar as the source of four great Indian rivers, the Indus, the Ganges, the Satlej, and the Brahmaputra.
actually only the satluj flows from the lake but the headwaters of the others all rise nearby on the flanks of mount kailash we were within the striking distance of the great mountain and i was eager to forge ahead but i had to wait shitan told me to go and drink some tea in the horse only cafe which like all the other buildings in the town was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows the good view of the lake through one of them helped to compensate for the drought i was served by a chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around on my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and a thermos of tea half an hour later sitan relieved me from my solitary confinement and we drove past a lot more rocks and rubbish westwards out of town towards mount kailash my experience in horror came as a stark contrast to accounts i had read of earlier travelers first encounters with lake mansarovar ikai kawaguchi a japanese monk who had arrived there in 1900 was so moved by the sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears a couple of years later the hallowed waters had a similar effect on seven hadin a swed who wasn't prone to sentimental outbursts it was dark by the time we finally left again and after 10:30 pm we drew up outside a guest house in darchen for what turned out to be another troubled night kicking around in the open air rubbish dump that passed for the town of hor had set off my cold once more though if truth be told it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea one of my nostrils was blocked again and as i lay down to sleep i was unconvinced that the other would provide me with sufficient oxygen my watch told me i was at 4760 meters it wasn't much higher than bravo and there's i had been gasping for oxygen several times every night i had grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances by now but they still scared me tired and hungry i started breathing through my mouth after a while i switched to single nostril power which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen but just as i was drifting off my i woke up ad- abruptly something was wrong my chest felt strangely heavy and i sat up a movement that cleared my nasal passages almost instantly and relieved the feeling in my chest curious i thought i lay back down and tried again same result i was on the point of disappearing into the land of nod where something told me not to it must have been those emergency electrical impulses again but this was not the same as on previous occasions this time i wasn't gasping for breath i was simply not allowed to go to sleep sitting up once more immediately made me feel better i could breathe freely and my chest felt fine but as soon as i lay down my sinuses filled and my chest was awed i tried propping myself upright against the wall 
but now I couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off. I couldn't put my finger on the reason, but I was afraid to go to sleep. A little voice inside me was saying that if I did, I might never wake up again. So I stayed awake all night. Sitan took me to the Darchan Medical College the following morning. The medical college at Darchan was new and looked like a monastery from the outside, with a very solid door that led into a large courtyard. We found the consulting room, which was dark and cold and occupied by a Tibetan doctor who wore none of the paraphernalia that I would been expecting. No white coat. He looked like any other Tibetan with a thick pullover and a woolly hat when I explained my sleepness symptoms and my sudden aversion to lying down. He shot me a few questions while feeling the veins in my wrist. It's a cold, he said finally through Sitan. A cold and the effect of altitude. I will give you something for it. I asked him if he thought I did recover enough to be able to do the Kora. Oh yes, he said, you will be fine. I walked out of the medical college, clutching a brown envelope stuffed with 15 screws of paper. I had a five-day course of Tibetan medicine which I started right away. I opened an after-breakfast package and found it contained a brown powder that I had to take with hot water. It tasted like cinnamon. The contents of the lunchtime and bedtime packages were less obviously identifiable. Both contained small spherical brown pellets. They looked suspiciously like sheep dung. But of course I took them. That night, after my first full day's course, I slept very soundly, like a log, not a dead man. Once he saw that I was going to leave, Sitan left me to return to Lhasa. As a Buddhist, he told me, he knew that it didn't really matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for his business. Darshan didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep. It was still dusty, partially derelict, and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse. But the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky, and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of Himalayas commanded by a huge snow-capped mountain, Gurla Mandhata, with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit. The town had a couple of rudimentary general stores selling Chinese cigarettes, soap and other basic provisions as well as the usual strings of prayer flags. In front of one, men gathered in the afternoon for a game of pool. The battered table, looking supremely incongruous in the open air, while nearby women washed their long hair in the icy water of a narrow brook that babbled down the past my guest house. Darshan felt relaxed and unhurried, but for me, it came with a significant drawback. There were no pilgrims. I had been told that at the height of the pilgrimage season, the town was bustling with visitors. Many brought their own accommodation 
enlarging the settlement round its edges as they set up their tents which spilled down onto the plain. I had timed my arrival for the beginning of the season, but it seemed I was too early. One afternoon I sat pondering my options over a glass of tea in Darchin's only cafe. After a little consideration, I concluded they were severely limited. Clearly, I hadn't made much progress with my self-help program on positive thinking. In my defense, it hadn't been easy with all my sleeping difficulties, but however I looked at it, I could only wait. The pilgrimage trail was well trodden, but I didn't fancy doing it alone. The Kora was seasonal because parts of the route were liable to blockage by snow. I had no idea whether or not the snow had cleared, but I wasn't encouraged by the chunks of dirty ice that still clung to the banks of Darchin's brook. Since Sitan had left, I hadn't come across anyone in Darchin with enough English to answer even the most basic question. Until this, I met Norbu. The cafe was small, dark and cavernous, with a long metal stove that ran down the middle. The walls and ceiling were wreathed in sheets of multicolored plastic of the striped variety, broad blue, red and white, that is made into stout, voluminous shopping bags sold all over China and in many other countries of Asia as well as Europe. At such plastic must rate as one of the China's most successful exports along the Silk Road today. The cafe had a single window beside I had taken up position so that I could see the pages of my notebook. I had also brought a Nobu with me to help pass the time. Norbu saw my book when he came in and asked with a gesture if he could sit opposite me at my rickety table. You English? he inquired. After he had ordered tea, I told him I was, and we stuck up a conversation. I didn't think he was from those parts because he was wearing a wind cheater and metal rimmed spectacles of western style. He was Tibetan, he told me, but worked in Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in the Institute of Ethnic Literature. I assumed he was on some sort of field work. Yes and no, he said. I have come to do the Kora. My heart jumped. Norbu had been writing academic papers about the Kailash Kora and its importance in various works of Buddhist literature for many years, he told me. But he had never actually done it himself. When the time came for me to tell him what brought me here to Darchin, his eyes lit up. We could be a team, he said excitedly. Two academics who had ex sorry, who have escaped from the library. Perhaps any positive thinking strategy was working after all. My initial relief at meeting Norbu, who was also staying in the guest house, was tempered by the realization that he was almost as ill-equipped as I was for the pilgrimage. He kept telling me how fat he was and how hard it was going to be. Very high up, he kept reminding me. 
so tiresome to walk. He wasn't really a practicing Buddhist. It transpired, but he had enthusiasm and he was of course Tibetan. Although I had originally envisaged making the trek in the company of devout believers, on reflection I decided that perhaps Norbu would turn out to be the ideal companion. He suggested we hire some yaks to carry our luggage, which I interpreted as a good sign, and he had no intention of prostrating himself all round the mountain. Not possible, he cried, collapsing across the table in hysterical laughter. It wasn't his style, and anyway, his tummy was too big. So with this, the story comes to an end. Now time for some questions. Understanding the text. Part 1. Give reasons for the following statements. 1. The article has been titled Silk Road. 2. Tibetan mastiffs were popular in China's imperial courts. 3. The author's experience at Hor was in stark contrast to earlier accounts of the place. 4. The author was disappointed with Darchin. 5. The author thought that his positive thinking strategy worked well after all. Part 2. Briefly comment on 1. The purpose of the author's journey to Mount Kailash 2. The author's physical condition in Darchin 3. The author's meeting with Norbu 4. Sitan's support to the author during the journey. 5. As a Buddhist, he told me he knew that it didn't really matter if I passed away, but he thought it would be bad for business. Talking about the text, discuss in groups of four. 1. The sensitive behavior of hill folk. 2. The reasons why people unwillingly, sorry, Willingly undergo the travails of difficult journeys. 3. The accounts of exotic places in legends and the reality. Thinking about the language. Notice the kind of English Sitan uses while talking to the author. How do you think he picked it up? 2. What do the following utterances indicate? Bit 1. I told her. Through Daniel. Bit 2. It's a cold. He said finally through Sitan. Number 3. Guess the meaning of the words. 1. Kora. 2. Drogba. 3. Kyang. In which language are these words found? Working with words. 1. The narrative has many phrases to describe the scenic beauty of the mountainside like a flawless half moon floated in a perfect blue sky. Scan the text to locate other such picturesque phrases. Number 2. Explain the use of the adjectives in the following phrases. Bit 1. Shaggy monsters. Bit 2. Brackish lakes. Bit 3. Rickety table, bit 4, hairpin bent, bit 5, rudimentary general stores. Noticing form, 1. The account has only a few passive voice sentences. Locate them. In what way does the use of active voice contribute to the style of the narrative? 2. Notice this construction. Sitan was eager to have them fixed. Write five sentences with a similar structure. Things to do. The plateau is pockmarked with salt flats and brackish lakes. Vestiges of the Tethys Ocean was bordered Tibet before 
the continental collision that lifted it skyward. Given below is an extract from an account of the Tethys Ocean downloaded from the internet. Go online, key in Tethys Ocean in Google search and you will find exhaustive information on this geological event. You can also consult an encyclopedia. Today, India, Indonesia and the Indian Ocean covered the area once occupied by Tethys Ocean. Turkey, Iraq and Tibet sit on the land once known as Cimmeria. Most of the floor of the Tethys Ocean disappeared under Cimmeria and Laurasia. We only know that Tethys existed because geologists like Suez have found fossils of ocean creatures in rocks in the Himalayas. So we know those rocks were underwater before the Indian continental shelf began pushing upward as it smashed into Samaria. We can see similar geological evidence in Europe where the movement of Africa raised the Alps. Chapter number 8 also has a poem along with the story. And the name of the poem is Father to Son. And it is written by Elizabeth Jennings. So the poem starts, stanza 1. I do not understand this child. Though we have lived together now, in the same house for years, I know nothing of him. So try to build up a relationship from how he was when small. Yet have I cured. Stanza 2 The seed I spent or sown it where the land is his and none of mine. We speak like strangers. There's no sign of understanding in the air. This child is built to my design. Yet, what he loves, I cannot share. Stanza 3 Silence surrounds us. I would have him prodigal, returning to his father's house, the home he knew, rather than see him make the move his world. I would forgive him too, shaping from sorrow a new love. Stanza 4 Father and son, we both must live on the same globe and the same land. He speaks, I cannot understand myself, why anger grows from grief. We each put out an empty hand, longing for something to forgive. So with this, the poem comes to an end. Now time for some question and answers. Think it out. Question number one. Does this poem talk of an exclusively personal experience or is it fairly universal? Question number two. How does the father's helplessness brought out in the poem? Question number three. Identify the phrases and lines that indicate distance between father and son. Question number four. Does the poem have a consistent rhyme scheme? 